look at your Bible, Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, and we have in these uh, Wednesdays nothing spectacular, just simple lessons and principles. Um, and during these weeks, uh, we've been going over beginnings, where things started, and um, uh, we're just uh, kind of chipping away at things, where sin came from, the family, where it came from. Tonight, I want to talk about where, where governments came from. There are people who are anarchists. They don't want anybody to tell anybody what to do, and and um, they don't want any governing anything anywhere. But it's interesting, wherever that kind of person goes, they want to be in charge. It's just uh, amazing. It, you know, if you want to go to the French Revolution, these people who hated the cruel, overbearing lives of the uh, nobility, and then the poor people did the exact same thing. It just doesn't matter. Uh, they're just as wicked. But in Genesis 9, very uh, simple thought here, and then we're going to look at a, a, a half dozen or so verses through the, the uh, scriptures here. Um, and uh, if you just look with me there at Genesis chapter 9, um, they're off the ark. The flood has just happened. And in verse 1 of Genesis 9, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, that's the beginning again of a human race from Noah and his wife and the boys and their wives. And then he just goes, he goes right into, and it's interesting, maybe I should read these, but we are in such a world of, uh, where folks don't like rules. They don't like anybody telling them what to do and, and they'll call it legalism. You know, as soon as you say you should do this and you shouldn't do that, uh, you're some kind of a legalistic, well, um, the biblical definition of legalism is when you're adding works to, to grace to get saved. Legalism is you have to be baptized to get saved. Legalism is you have to take communion to be saved. Uh, faith, the Church of Christ, faith plus baptism, plus living a good life, plus repentance, plus whatever other things they think of. Um, but holiness is not legalism. Holiness is good sense. Um, you know, the fact that you get married, you probably don't want your spouse to still be in close contact with former boyfriends or girlfriends. Uh, that's not legalism. That's called love. And, uh, but God, God sure has a lot of rules, doesn't he? You don't go very far in the Bible without finding rules. And so don't get mad at rules. Don't let the devil get you thinking all these do's and don'ts are bad things. Stop lights. All these do's and don'ts. Go when it's green. Stop when it's red. Why can't they all be yellow? You know, go to work at McDonald's. They don't like me wearing my Burger King uniform. What is their problem? It's all about the burger, isn't it? No, it's not. It's about being a part of the whole thing. Um, anyway, so many things like that. I mean, if you want to ride skateboards, you can't pull your pants up. Everybody knows you can't ride a skateboard unless your pants are down around your knees. And um, it, it just, anyhow, so... Don't be griping that God has a few rules, okay? So he does, he goes through some, some rules there, and he talks about um, eating and drinking and offerings and things. But I want you to look at verse 6 of, a, of Genesis 9. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And then he goes on, be fruitful, multiply abundantly. And we're going to look at some more verses, but there in verse 6, he basically establishes a handful of principles. And then we're going to look at some more verses. You remember, remember the city of refuge? I, I didn't think of it until just now, but the city of refuge was a place where if you accidentally killed somebody, um, you know, you ran over them with your chariot or whatever, and all the family's trying to get you. Uh, you could run to a city of refuge, and no one could come into the city of refuge and hurt you. You were safe there until the judges could look into the matter, and, and uh, it was a place of protection. And, um, but even that was civil authority keeping order because we're emotional and in passion. We say things and we do things, and so we need laws. And laws are established by the, the head of each area, whatever that kind of government might be. Um, now, we've got, we've got uh, God is for government is obvious because... He said in Ephesians that the husband is the head of the wife. So God wants, God, all, the word government means a set of rules and a set of leaders and people who, who make the decisions. 
And so God makes it very clear in Ephesians. You go to Ephesians 5, this, all these. But he, uh, he, the, the, he establishes the government of a home. But he also says, servants, be subject to your masters. So he establishes the government in the place of employment. And in that case, it might not have been employment. It might have been slavery. But, so, but it's still the same thing. There are governments. There's ways to run things. In the church, he established the pastors. In the pastor, he says, obey them that have the rule over you. Uh, who've spoken you the word of truth, whose faith follow. He talks about the pastor is the, the overseer, the, the bishop, this one who oversees. Um, not anybody that runs your life and tells you what you can and can't do, but the one who is the basic administrator. Um, I oversee things. I, don't, I couldn't have told you what the teens were singing tonight, but I have veto power over the youth department. And uh, Ron takes care of the, the choir and special music. But I do carry veto power, and he sends me a, uh, you know, a, a list of uh, suggested things for the month, and, and uh, sometimes I read it, sometimes I don't. But, <laughs> but I trust him, and because uh, if he messes up, his wife will fix him, and uh, we've all got those things. <clears throat> so I, I'm, I may be overseer, but it does that doesn't mean I've got to do everything or boss every little moment along. Uh, I don't have time to take care of all the things around my house. Now, there's too much to do. And you have three or four babies at home and a job, um, and somebody better take care of who, you know, I could care less whether the vacuum needs the bag changed. That's not my problem. You know what? You say, well, what if the vacuum's not working? I'll buy any vacuum. No, not really. I wouldn't do that. My wife, it's, it's my, that's my wife's business. She takes care of the house. And if it's something big that I need to do, she'll ask me, and I'll tell her, do it yourself. Um, but there are, we've divided duties and, and um, Brother Howells always taught us the best way to peace is segregate your duties and everybody have their air. We go shopping. I, my job is to push the cart. That's all I do. And uh, my wife picks it out and then and, and I swipe my ATM card. That's the, only, that's the only vote I get at the grocery store. Or how many times I go buy the same sample at Costco. That's my job. Uh, you know, I change hats, take my coat off. <laughs> I grab somebody's kid, say, can I walk your kid over to get a sample? And I, and uh, I don't do that, but I've, I have thought about it. The heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah said, and desperately wicked. But so God sets up governments. He says, and we're going to look now about government, what we consider government. But understand this, government and authority and leadership, it's a biblical thing. Don't let it bother you. Young people, don't get a chip on your shoulder that there are uh, standards and rules and and things at work or at home, don't panic. My goodness, the world is that way. Right. You're going to go build a house. There are specs on, on uh, how big a header has to be over a window and if you, or over a door, and it might be a 4x4 four four for that door, but a double door back there is going to be a 4x6. And Look, there's rules. There's rules for everything. My car is the dumb car, my truck and my car. One uses 530 and one uses 1030. Why can't they agree? Why do I have to have two kinds of oil in my garage? But anyway, um, dumb people. But, well, because one is, is God made, it's a GM product, and one is a Chrysler. And you know who makes other, other vehicles. And it's not God. And I don't believe in purgatory. But, but there are standards of, of what you should and, and shouldn't do. And, and um, every place you go, there's standards, whether it be um, cooking. You know, you, you're going to make some cookies. You pull the cookbook out. This legalistic cookbook, it says 325 degrees. I'll cook it at any temperature I want. Well, go ahead. Cook it at 1,000 degrees. It's like when your kids, we've always let our kids cook. When they were, as soon as they were big enough to not burn themselves. And it's always funny seeing a kid trying to cook a cookie or pancakes or whatever and you know just how how high you just got to learn you know and, uh, and we still we've we, who knows with an electric stove you just burn everything on an electric stove but but we've always had gas at one little window of time when we burned everything but but everywhere we go there are rules and and there are things you should do and shouldn't do and how you should set it up and and we ought to love that stuff we ought to it puts order it puts consistency uh, I've told the story when I was in Indiana, uh, we were so broke, I'd go to Wild Bill's Wrecking Yard and, and get everything I needed for my car. And, uh, you know, if, if, and if I needed a tire, I'd take the tire down to Wild Bill's, roll it or get someone to give me a ride. And I'd, just, I'd go around the yard 
until I found a rim that had the same pattern of holes, the same distance. I didn't care about the rubber, I cared about the steel. As long as the steel would bolt. So I'm going down the road like this, because these are big tires and these are, you know, these are slicks and these are mud and snow and the right front is a radial and the right rear is a bias. And, and I did find out that your tires wear out faster when you do that. There are rules. Rules are good things. Standards are good things. Policies are there for a reason. And it's not all sin. It's just good sense sometimes. Uh, just, but anyway, so we talk about government. Government is merely the people who are in a position to create rules to create order. That's what government is. Uh, you know, you, you go to a, a place of employment. Now, I can do things here at our church you couldn't do anywhere else. Um, we have some policies and things for our staff, but they're minimal. But most places, they want you in at a certain time and out at a certain time and to work so many hours. And then there's all these requirements and you have to, you know why? Because we're lazy and we won't work. But uh, government, God set up here in Genesis 9, 6, he says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall the, his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now, several principles of government are set up here. First of all, the most obvious capital punishment is set up. So it becomes legitimate that men can create, according to their own dictates and their own uh, ideas. God doesn't set up earthly governments, he sets up leaders. But we get the option of creating governments, and uh, I don't believe Hitler would have ever been in charge had the people not wanted Hitler to be in charge. Stalin would not have, not have uh, caused the mess and murdered the millions had the people not made the decision to, uh, to put him in that position. Now, they lie and they deceive and they cheat, and uh, they say, you, they, I mean, when Stalin and Hitler took their jobs, they promised you'll be able to keep your insurance and you'll be able to keep your doctor if you like. Uh, those are just typical things of dictator, uh, murderous people. They do those things. They also have their own servers at home. But, um, but um, in, um, we get what we want. And, and by the way, you'll get what you want in your church. It's off the subject, but... but uh, if, if God sees that his people would rather have a soft, wimpy, do-nothing church, he'll let you have it. And, uh, and your kids will pay the price, and your community will pay the price, and at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll pay the price. And not that you'll pay, but you will not have the rewards you could have had. Uh, you want to be the one pushing to keep the church passionate and on fire and excited. And you don't want a passive church. You don't want to lay back. Uh, you, don't, you don't want, uh, I heard this from Brother, uh, uh, Brother Obero preached at our uh, couple's retreat. Uh, we were talking, he's 62, and we were talking about as you get older, what do you do with your church? And when do you decide you're too old to pastor? Because the people are going to keep saying, oh, you're fine, you know, because they love you. And, you know, you're, you, you, you speak for three minutes and you repeat the same story four times in your three minutes. Um, and he said, he was told, when you become a papa preacher, you should retire. And uh, so I said, well, what's a papa preacher? Well, it's papa. When the grandkids come over to our house, it's nana and papa. Papa, you can do anything you want around papa. He won't spank you. He won't chew you out. He won't, not at our house, but at most houses. But um, he said, when you, become a, when you become a papa preacher and everything's okay and you don't worry about it, let everybody do whatever they want. He said, it's time to retire. You need, you need to have a mean old man in the pulpit. That's what Brother Hiles always taught us. But uh, so, first of all, capital punishment, that men should set up a system where you can't let somebody go around killing people because people are made in the image of God. They matter. And so there are people that should be eliminated from the planet. That's God's plan. But we see here, they're just simple thoughts. That means there has to be somebody who decides how and when and who will make those decisions. Do we want the jury like we have in America? Or do we want vigilantes that just go take people out? Uh, do we want to let it be Jezebel who has people lie about Naboth and Naboth is killed? Um, there's all, and so it's our job to set up the who, what, where, and how, but that there ought to be a government system that establishes the punishment of evildoers. That's simple. You can't get people, the more people you get in each spot, the more rules you need. When we start our school, we just had, I don't know, 15 people or so in our school, 
and we didn't have any rules. I, I met with the girls especially, and I said, now listen, you girls are going to dress right, or if I have one problem with dress, I will buy double-knit polyester blue jumpers, and you will wear them every day from kindergarten until you graduate from high school. And they all swore that they would dress right, right? Mrs. Bailey, you were in there in that group. She, we just have had problems with her, but anyway. Um, I, I threatened them. And then we got to the ear where they all wanted double-knit polyester things. <laughs> but uh, so you, you, we kind of set up our own system of government. Now look over to Nehemiah with me. And uh, let's just talk about now. That was just a very simple. There's only eight people on the planet. And with eight people on the planet, God sets up some laws. And God began the simplest form of government. So you find Nehemiah. And um, let's look at a couple things in Nehemiah chapter 1. I don't know where Nehemiah is either. Just keep flipping around. You'll find it sooner or later. You got Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And because Nehemiah is a part of rebuilding the wall, so that means the kings had to all be gone. And they had to go into captivity, and then they had to come back. And so look at Nehemiah. Uh, chapter 1, and we'll just look at a couple of these um, simple things. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. He was taken captive from Israel, carried across to Babylon, and he worked his way into a position. But look at what's going on in Nehemiah chapter 1, and look at verse 11, the last verse. Nehemiah heard how the Jerusalem was in, in a mess, and he goes to God, and he's praying. And then in verse 11, he kind of ends, he closes his prayer. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. Now keep your place, we're gonna keep reading. So Nehemiah is praying for his home country, praying that the buildings would get built, the walls would be built. And he's praying that God would have favor on him because he had commitments to a king. There was an earthly heathen sovereign. This was not a Jewish king. This wasn't Solomon or David or Uzziah or Asa. This was a heathen. This is a guy who had no problem going in and wiping out countries. But Nehemiah was there as a servant in this foreign land. And Nehemiah, his, his prayer was, Lord, help me to have favor in this guy's eyes. Now look at chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll read these, just these first few verses. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, at the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been aforetime sad in his presence. The king didn't want anybody sad. And he said, you come around me, you be happy. By the way, that's a, that's a good rule in your home. You ought to tell your kids that. Uh, you, you kids be happy or you're not eating. Rrr. Nobody would going to be mean around here but your mother. Um, I mean, your father. Um, so he'd never been mean in his king's presence. Verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Now we're going to read another verse in a minute, but we'll be in, in Romans chapter 12 in a minute, in Romans 13. Uh, Nehemiah, he was afraid of displeasing this heathen king. Go through Proverbs. We don't have time on a Wednesday night. But if you want to go through Proverbs and look up the word king in your concordance, and it talks about if you get the king mad at you, that's really stupid. The Bible says, a gift pacifieth anger. You should give gifts to kings. Why? So they don't kill you. Duh, come on now. Be nice to the guy who can take your head off. We've got a neighbor who's uh, highway patrol, and, uh, and we're good to her. We want a cop on our side if things go wrong. Um, so uh, that's what, so Nehemiah was concerned, and you'll see that in Romans in a minute, but look at verse 3. And, he, and so Nehemiah now, he said to the king, let the king live forever. Very common phrase. You'll see that with Daniel. 
When he was in the lion's den, oh, king, live forever. It's that compliment of, oh, you're, a lot of these kings thought they were deity. Now, they knew they were going to die, and they, you know, they didn't want to get shot or poisoned or whatever, but they're just stupid, arrogant men. But remember Herod, he got eaten by worms because they said, it's the voice of a god, and he thought that was great, and the worms came and ate him up. Um, I want to see that in a replay up in heaven. There's going to be some great things in big screen. Uh, maybe they'll drive in theater up in heaven. I don't know. But um, so he said that the king live forever. Why should not my countess be sad when the city of um, the city, the place of my father's sepulchers lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. And he begins to talk with the king and the king says, what are you asking for? And he says, well, I'd like to go do something about my home. But Nehemiah, was in a position in another country to a heathen king. He treated that king with respect. He treated that king with fear. And he was, had a plan. He negotiated with the king. Um, look, God's people, we live in this world system. Um, you know, don't, those judges have authority. You go to court, they have authority. I taught this a few, maybe a couple months ago. But on your Ten Commandments, there's two tables. The one table, the government's got no business. Have no gods before me, and don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That first table, you, you, you search that out in American history, and even pre-American history, um, Christians understood the two tables of the law. The first table is between a man and his God. The second table is between a man and men. And that one between man and men, that is the one the government can, can legitimately regulate. That's why we get speed limit laws. That's why we have uh, laws about serving in the military. And we have all, all the, of course, America's gone really overboard in their laws, right? But, um, and then we gotta, we've got to have 10,000 pages of instructions to get somebody's broken arm fixed. What is wrong with our medical system? But um, remember the days when you go to the doctor and the doctor looked at it and said, yep, you got a broken arm. Er! Wraps it up, sends you home, and everything's all right. You give them 50 bucks, and it's done. Um, we, we messed it up. But, but the two, as long as we separate the two tables, somebody walks in here and says, you need to stop preaching now. I would say, you can have a seat, or you can leave. Because you don't run this church, nor do you tell me when to preach, where to preach. Remember John Bunyan, if you weren't here, our boys did the trial of John Bunyan, Claire, back in the 1600s. Baptists knew nobody's telling me when to preach, where to preach, nor to whom pre to preach. And you're not going to give me permission to preach, because if you give me permission, that means you can take permission. So I'm preaching because I'm going to preach. But you can tell me to register my car and insure it. You say, why? Because if you run into me without insurance and you don't have enough money to fix my car, I'm going to bust your nose. That's love your neighbor as yourself. The simplest law, as Jesus said, I'll take that whole Old Testament law, wrap it up into two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the division of the two tables of the law. This is between you and your God. Don't let anybody mess with it. This is between you and men, and it is your obligation to live peaceably with your fellow man. You know, I might just feel like it's my right to go around shooting windows and doors and, spare, you know, I want to get a machine gun and shoot all the, the sparrows and pigeons I see. I don't have any real holy regard for pigeons or sparrows, but I don't think it's smart to shoot a, a machine gun around a bunch of houses like we got here. I got no problem with machine guns. I got a problem with houses. And um, that's the problem we've got. If we all lived in the country like we should, we'd carry any kind of gun we want. But there are, to love your neighbors yourself. My kids are riding their bicycles in the street. You better keep a speed limit. You better be careful. And all those sorts of things are, are those laws. And that's the division. So here Nehemiah was under the authority. Remember Daniel. The, the king said, you, everybody's going to bow down and worship that statue. They said, no, we're not. You, you, boy, the king got so mad. You guys are going to bow down and worship that statue when you hear the music. Oh, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Whose who's God is going to save you then? They said, well, our God is able, but whether he does or not, we're not, we're not worshiping your, your statue. That's first table Christianity. Have no, I don't have any idols. Have no other gods before me. They're not going to do it. Daniel wasn't supposed to pray at all. And Daniel said, no, I'm going to pray three times a day. Now, there's no law. You have to pray three times a day. But it was Daniel's habit. Three times a day, he opened the window and prayed toward Jerusalem. And he got thrown in the lion's den. Don't let anybody mess with your faith. But, but government is a part of things. And you read of the story, Daniel and the Hebrew, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are very respectful, very gracious. 
Um, they weren't ugly toward their governmental leaders. Jesus said that you shalt, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. When, or Paul the Apostle did when he was tried there uh, at the end of the book of Acts. To have respect and dignity, and I probably go a little too far sometimes, but it's very hard when I'm carnal and we have the kind of leaders we have politically. Look over to Romans 13 real quickly here. And again, a lot of this is familiar to you, but for the sake of our young people and for all of us to remember, let's, I want us all to understand government's good. You know what a mess we'd have without government? We'd have bullies. And whoever was the biggest thug would be the government. And, you know, people say, oh, this is horrible. You know, the mafia is buying off the politicians and buying off the cops. Well, we have the same thing. They just don't call it mafia. They call them de Democrats. And, um, or unions. And, um, and I'm not saying everything a union does is bad. But, but um, you know, don't, don't act like Republicans and Democrats today don't buy people off. That's craziness. As long as there, there is humanity, there'll be corruption in the banks and there'll be corruption in the job. And I mean, look, there's corruption at Walmart and in the healthcare system and in the welfare system. It, look, people are bad. So we have to decide what kind of a government will we have. Romans 13, very simple principles. He says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For this, and this is what's so important, this next phrase, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And that's back in the book of Daniel, and we don't have time to go back there, but Daniel said, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and, and, and setteth, oh, there's three different times it says it, but, but different phrasing, but basically says that God sets over it the basest of men, or he sets over government whoever he will. God puts people in government position. And you might say, why would God let a wicked man be in authority? As I said before, I think God gives us the leaders that we deserve or the leaders we want or the leaders we ask for. I think, I think as a church, uh, we can get the pastor we want. And um, you, you just got to keep your passion for God or you're going to, you know, we're all prone to laziness. You know, if somebody right now gave me a billion dollars and said, look, I'll give you this billion dollars, just tell your people they don't need to give anymore. We had a vote on it. Lots of our people would vote on not having offerings anymore. But you know, if we had a billion dollars in the bank, you're still supposed to tithe? You don't tithe because the, the church needs the money. You tithe because God wants you to tithe. That's why you tithe. You give to others, you know, you, you give to others because you're supposed to care about people. It's not just me supposed to care about people, not just somebody else. You're supposed to care about people and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So look there in Romans 13, verse 2. Wherefore, or whosoever therefore resisteth the power. What's the power? That's verse 1. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. The ordinance. You know what an ordinance is? An ordinance is a rule. An ordinance is a law. And so we, we look at a, a, a law of our land about buildings or, or whatever laws are in our country. And those laws are there. Those are ordinances of God. Now, somebody comes along to the apostles and says, we don't want you preaching in Jesus' name. You have to go to Acts 4. We don't have time to go through all this, but you go to Acts chapter 4. They said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Whether it be right to, to obey you more than God, judge ye. But we'll, we're going to speak Jesus' name. That's why, because that's first table. That's between them and God. And you're not shutting up a preacher that's right with God. And uh, that's a locked-in thing. But over on the other side, you want to tell me, um, you know, taxes and, and uh, speed limits and register your car? You understand most of the laws we have in America are unconstitutional and wrong, right? If you, don't, if you think all of America's laws are constitutional, you're not paying attention. But it is our country. And those are our governmental leaders, and they can throw us in jail. I really don't want to go to jail. I heard they give you free food, but I don't want to try it out, all right? Verse 3, verse, uh, yeah, verse three. for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? And that's what we read earlier in Nehemiah. We should be afraid. 
that red and blue light flashing behind you, you should be afraid. Why? Because they have power. They have authority. They can write you a ticket. They can repossess your, repossess. They can impound your car. They can impound you for warrants and things that you don't have taken care of. That's the power. You know, and the, and the police lady might be a 110 pound little girl, but as long as she's got that 45 on her side and a badge, she's power. She's got authority. And uh, don't, don't fuss with the authority unless you're willing to say, between me and God, I'm not going to listen to you. And again, we've, been, we've gone through this in our Baptist stories. Look over quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2. I didn't take time, but if you kept going in Romans 13, the Bible says that those political leaders are God's ministers. It's hard to believe our governors and mayors and police are ministers, but that's what God calls them. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and look down at verse 12. 1 Peter 2, 12, having your conscience honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So these are what's what unsaved people think of you. And your life should be so good that the unsaved people glorify God. Verse 13, submit yourself to every ordinance, there's that word ordinance again, or law, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be the king as supreme or the governors as them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do good. Look at the end of verse 13. He says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for whose sake? Do you know when we are in rebellion against authorities, it hurts God's name. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, when it talks about wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband, and it talks about holy women of old who trusted in God were submissive to their husbands. When a lady puts herself in submission, and the word submission does not mean slavery, it doesn't mean she's a punching bag, submission, sub meaning under, mission meaning the cause, or what are we trying to achieve here? And so um, a woman shouldn't have her own cause, her own agenda. The man is the agenda setter for the job, for the family, for our goals, and a woman is to make sure that everything she does is supporting that mission. Her mission should be underneath and supporting his mission. And I can't tell you what my wife's got in the freezer. I know there's, I know there's um, chocolate moose traps ice cream in the freezer because I went to the store and bought it. And I uh, say, why didn't she buy it? Because she doesn't buy ice cream. And if I want ice cream, I go, or I tell her and she would buy it. If I said, buy me some, she would. But, but um, I don't run her. But we do keep the whole house under my mission. Understand this, you single girls. You be very careful who you marry because God's will is that you make sure everything in your home supports and follows the mission of that guy. And you're, you young ladies are in a generation right now that is so much girl-oriented. And she's got her little world here and her little world there and her little world there. Oh, yes, and she's got a husband, too. That's not biblical. Now, the woman in Proverbs 31, she made clothes, sewed them. She bought property, and she planted vineyards, and she sold fruit. I mean, we're talking. She did this on her own. Her husband wasn't around. She's a busy lady. But everything she did, she kept under the mission of her husband. And she, she, was, she was a woman that, if you see at the end of Proverbs 31, her husband is praised in the gates. Not her. Because this woman was such an amazing lady, her husband had a good name. For all we know, he just watched football, you know, ESPN and stuff like that. But he had the right wife. So you girls, you be careful who you marry. You make sure you marry a guy who's got the right dreams and the right mission, the right goals. Because if you're just, boy, passionate, I want to go, man, I want to be grass hut, climbing coconut trees, winning natives to Christ. Don't marry a guy who, who wants to stay in the States and, you know, take tickets at Disneyland. Now, there's nothing wrong with that job. But make sure you think about this stuff before you get going. Look over to, to 2 Peter chapter 2. And there was more where we just were on this thing of 